My name is Masha Gessen. I'm a staff writer at The New Yorker and a distinguished writer in residence at Bard College. Uh, my name is Francis Negro Montaner. I'm a professor at Columbia University, a curator, scholar, and filmmaker. And we're here today to talk about why words matter. So one way we could start to make it concrete real fast is just to maybe give some examples about how do words matter? So um, let, me, let me throw a few examples at you and I hope that they actually begin some threads that we can then pull on in this conversation. So one that I've thought about a lot and one that I think I'm very sensitive to is how we talk about immigration and how easy it's been for um, the right, for the Republican Party, for Trumpists, right, I, because there are different sort of forces that, that work in more or less the same direction or have been for the last, say, 15 years, um, to move the language uh, and, and move the terms of the debate about immigration and move the way we think about immigration by using different words. So, um, you know, everybody knows that we shouldn't say illegal immigrant uh, and we should say undocumented immigrant, another term that I actually hate because nobody carries more paper with them than the people that we refer to as undocumented, right? It's U.S. citizens who leave their houses without so much as a driver's license, right? Uh, but it's the people who worry about their day-to-day -day safety in this country or who are crossing into this country who carry around sheets and sheets of paper documenting their every move. Um, but having, having settled an undocumented immigrant, then we do things like refer to people who are in this country illegally, which creates an entire way of legitimizing you know, so-called border security, another very important term, um, and, and, and goes a long way toward creating this discourse of deterrence, another extremely important word. Right? And um, you know, I think back to this conversation that I had on MSNBC with a wonderful host who, um, I think we were talking about the, the, the family separation policy, <clears throat> and at one point he said, okay, but does it actually help deter? Immigrants and I said that's you know you can't ask that question that's a horrible question to ask like the problem with that question is the question and he said okay yes so does it uh, which was just such a perfect example you know not of how bad that host was but of how firmly framed framed the debate had been by the words we use so that's one example quickly another example is of course the most recent uh, coverage of the uh, conflict. And here I go using the word conflict um, problematically in Israel-Palestine, right? Um, which begins with the use of the word evictions, which again is a legitimizing word. And I think it would be much more accurate to use the word expulsions, which the media gradually, or actually pretty fast, moved toward um, as the coverage developed. But then there's also the word clashes, right? which equalize the two sides and position the journalist in the middle of this imagined sort of equal conflict, right? And, and this is kind of a meta story because now we, there's the story of the young AP reporter who was literally fired for literally tweeting, as far as we can tell, words matter about the coverage of, 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 of Israel-Palestine over the last few weeks. Which is indicative that this question of whether words matter or how they matter is linked to power relations. And also for me, for uh, the ways power arrangements make difficult certain ways of being and certain possibilities. So a lot of my work is about the US unincorporated territories. So I actually worked on two, uh, uh, two territories and the ways that uh, the words are used in media. One is a, a classic, uh, which is the territory of Guam, uh, part of the Mariana Islands in the Pacific. And I, I noticed that uh, the newspapers of record, the Washington Post, the New York Times, were using words to describe Guam in the context of a uh, tension with the US na Navy as a tiny speck, a dot. Uh, so all words that were underscoring that it was so small. And when I kind of looked under the hood about what is this about, 
why so relentlessly describe a place as small when small is quite relative? Small in relation to what? In relation to many other islands in the region, Guam is quite large. Uh, so what was under the hood is the idea that because of its small size, quote unquote, meaning uh, less power than the US Navy and the United States, uh, Guam should somehow be uh, content or accepting that this is their fate, uh, uh, undermining the possibilities that, uh, and the aspirations of the people that live there. Um, and another one that's more complex uh, has to do with uh, Hurricane Maria, uh, hit in Puerto Rico in 2017. Myself, as many other people, uh, began to pay a lot of attention on how was this being was this covered because uh, we knew that um, it was a life or death matter. And many journalists in the US also saw that very early on. And one of the strategies that became uh, in use was calling Puerto Ricans our fellow Americans. And in my research, I figured that probably began when the governor of Puerto Rico himself addressed the people of the United States, our fellow Americans, strategically so they would care. Then the Weather Channel started picking it up and amplifying, which is fascinating because most people wouldn't think about the Weather Channel as a space where politics happen. But they were one of the first to pick it up with the same intent to make Americans care, other Americans or US citizens care. Uh, but then it went everywhere. And one of the most fascinating uh, things about it was the New York Times ran a pretty uh, lengthy piece calling Puerto Ricans our fellow Americans and explaining why what the US media called Puerto Ricans on the island was important and saying lives are at stake. Now, the fascinating thing for me after that juncture was that it created a debate. There was actually quite a lot of people that didn't appreciate that the strategy to make people in the United States care about what happened in Puerto Rico was to call Puerto Ricans Americans. One, because they're not Americans. Uh, and two, so that was kind of covering over that big uh, uh, identification question. By not Americans, you mean? Culturally, ethnically, not Americans. And that if you, by you meant by that was that Puerto Ricans on the island were US citizens, you were also covering up the fact that that US citizenship actually doesn't mean much because you cannot vote for president, you don't have a proportional delegation in Congress. So by calling Puerto Ricans our fellow Americans and either gesturing towards uh, uh, the same culture or a similar legal status was actually obscuring that Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States. And therefore the grounds for uh, the US to act was not that, that Puerto Ricans were our fellow Americans. <laughs> but that's an interesting example because on the one hand it was best intentioned based on research that suggested that even Trump voters at the time would be, were much more sympathetic to the idea of quote unquote helping or assisting Puerto Ricans if they knew that they were US citizens. Yet uh, it raised more questions, which I think it's something more general, that there is no perfect word or perfect strategy. There will be junctures where we use certain words and certain strategies, but those in turn are open to questioning and will once on the table, right? So I think that's actually the hardest thing for journalists to grasp because I think you know as uh, as social change movements have become more legitimate in the eyes of mainstream media, especially in the last decade or so, journalists have gotten used to the idea that language can be corrected, right? So for example, the George Floyd uh, uh, protests a year ago caused a lot of media organizations to send out memos to staff saying, okay, we're now going to be capitalizing black. Uh, although some of them appear to have also started capitalizing white uh, in a, in a, in a, yeah. Um, in a sense of equality, it has to be equal, right? That's a problematic premise. Right. Yeah. But then I think the idea that's much more difficult to grasp is that it's not a question of learning what the right words are and using them forever, right? Like, how do we actually think about changing language um, in, in media? I mean, I think one of the ways is that a journalist, but also scholars and all, all authority figures when it comes to the production of knowledge and uh, information and analysis, uh, is that for, um, for a long time in, in the hierarchical society that we live in, there are assigned people and platforms that are legitimized to say what is true. 
uh, or to be at least uh, uh, received in that manner. And we're living in a moment where those hierarchies and those forms of authority are coming into question by a multiplicity, a proliferation of social groups and social movements. Uh, so part, I think, of how to go about it is to start realizing that. You know, that uh, everybody uh, and all groups produce knowledge. Not all of them are legitimized and not all of them are provided with platforms to share or to uh, exchange that knowledge, but everybody is producing it. So therefore, it seems that, uh, I mean, on the ground, we can be looking at understanding that. Uh, we can be looking at creating uh, platforms that are uh, accessible to a greater number of people and also uh, possibilities of ac accountability. Uh, without uh, repression, you know, um, that people can question, that people can open up new, new possibilities. Um, and that's missing, I think, from the current landscape. Like, I'm not a journalist. I mean, I have written for newspapers. Uh, but as a scholar, as a filmmaker, these authority and these uh, um, uh, contexts and these premises that all these spaces are, are pretty shared. You know, for instance, uh, we've talked about the question of neutrality in journalism. Uh, the same methodological in the scientific method. So you're a dispassionate observer, uh, you know, looking at something and producing uh, knowledge that's universal. Uh, and uh, as we know, that's just not the way that knowledge is produced. So yeah, so let's focus on this idea of dispassionate observer. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, it's actually, it's, it's really clear and specific in American journalism. Like you're literally not supposed to care. Uh, and, um, and if you care about what you're writing about, that somehow makes you less credible. Right? Uh, which, which has always been a mystery to me, not just as a journalist, but as a human being. Like, why would I ever write about something that I don't care about? Right? Um, but, uh, you know, in, in, in US news media, it gets to the point where it's a badge of honor and sometimes a requirement to not vote in elections. So to, to, to actively, literally remove yourself from, from the sphere of political action um, and to say, well, you know, that gives me the right to position myself outside the, 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 the conversation and describe the conversation objectively. Another premise that goes with that uh, is the idea that there's two sides. And what you have to do to gain objectivity or, and credibility and, and sustain your authority is to provide a platform for the two sides, equal time, and, uh, and that solves the, the problematics of power and, and knowledge, right? So um, alternatives to that, you know, uh, it's interesting that in anthropology uh, over the last few decades, there's been a lot of work done about actually uh, the opposite strategy, which is situating yourself in context. So people actually know where you're coming from when you're saying the things that you're saying. Rather the, um, the myth and the fantasy that you can actually move, remove yourself, because even if you don't vote or even if you don't express your opinions, obviously doesn't mean you don't have them, but also how you're located intrinsically uh, is an ideological position. The assumption that there's neutrality and so forth are ideological positions. So there's really no escape. So perhaps uh, journalism would benefit from uh, incorporating other premises to uh, report and produce knowledge. And I think that's happening, right? I mean, uh, I don't want to make it sound like journalism is in the state that it was in you know, 40 or even 15 years ago, right? Um, I think the actual experience of consuming journalism in, in this country has changed significantly because people are much more likely, for example, to know what the person that they're reading looks like and are much less likely to know whether the media outlet is positioning what they're saying as news or opinion. I mean, there's actually no like way to have the physical experience of separation between news and opinion, which editors and media executives are a little bit slow to catch up to, uh, but, <clears throat> but it's already happened, right? Uh, so. So I think con media consumers are finding all sorts of ways to situate the person that they're reading and understand you know, what the, the information that they're receiving through, through that lens. Um, I think journalists are actually lagging behind in, sort of in helping w with that. Like how would the, could that be done better? 
Right. I think the other thing that's different from this juncture that's very important, that the very notion of consumer of is blurred because now people can also produce. Right. So they're consuming and they're producing, sometimes creating their own platforms, have a lot a, a proliferation of possibilities to uh, produce counter narratives, counter stories. Uh, of course, that's not entirely a free space uh, because it has its constraints. Uh, it's uh, as a platform is also heavily uh, um, uh, monitored by uh, and organized by algorithms or corporations. However, uh, the the the, the blurring and the diffusion of that um, consumer producer has the potential uh, to really uh, you know, generate new, alternative, new, new, new paradigms uh, for journalists to work with what used to be called sources, right? <laughs> you know, which now might be able to think about as collaborators in the knowledge production rather than just uh, a source that you extract from, you use, and then you, you move on. Right. No, and that's, again, in, in reporting, that's definitely happening in journalism, and I think that's actually been some of the most uh, promising work done, especially in investigative journalism, where the collaboration between the investigator and uh, or the, 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 the professional journalist and the source is transparent, right? I mean, that's the thing that was, uh, that was missing, and funnily, that returns us to the original idea of objectivity. The original idea of objectivity in journalism was not that the journalist is neutral, it's that the journalist is transparent. That the journalist is conducting an experiment that can be reproduced and sort of you know, the conceit is that if you, go, if you follow the path of the journalist and ask all the same questions of all the same people, you're going to get all the same answers. But then again, that's not true, right? right? And that gets us back to the question of who, who the journalist is and how the journalist sort of puts across and also the question of who's asking. Right. For what purpose? Right. And in what context? That reminds me of the census, you know, uh, in, in Puerto Rico, like where, where the pencil is asking you, are you white or black uh, or, or another category? People might answer differently, you know? So obviously that's not uh, a paradigm that is reproducible as an experiment. Um, now there was something that I wanted to say earlier that has to do with um, language and the region that we, um, that most people I think that are participating in the summit uh, write for, which is Latin America and people from Latin America that live uh, elsewhere, particularly in the US, which is that we come from a region where uh, words uh, have a, a very vexed history uh, we are a region where the, uh, the, the people that originally lived there on the moment Europeans um, uh, arrived, conquered, settled, um, dispossessed, uh, renamed. And this was not only a question of, of, of changing the name of flowers, uh, which was uh, uh, rivers and peoples, it was also epistemological. Uh, there was also a process by which uh, certain types of epistemologies that have to do with these assumptions that we've been discussing about uh, the dispassionate observer and so forth, uh, eliminated many other ways of framing things. Um, so I think part of the moment also calls for uh, work that um, uh, permits uh, the, that there are more than one perspective. So it's not, also, not the words in isolation, uh, but really, how does uh, words fit into particular epistemological uh, contexts, and how do they articulate a diversity of perspectives? And the richness would be not in telling the authoritative, the complete story, uh, but actually uh, to render the complexity, which would require uh, all of those uh, perspectives and, and vocabularies. Like, for instance, um, um, there was a report uh, not long ago um, uh, by the Pew Research Center uh, saying that only 3% of Latinos uh, like to uh, use uh, Latinx to describe themselves, and therefore it was an irrelevant category. And I think another way of framing that would be uh, from the start, the group that is called Latinos or Hispanics is tremendously diverse, and you can only create a homogenizing category or experience by exerting tremendous violence on this group Therefore, wouldn't it be in a better place if we just uh, accept that as a premise and then if 3% or more, and we know that there are methodological issues to this report also that didn't really talk to young people, which are the more likely to use the category. Uh, but the, what's under the hood of that report is like the authorizing that way of calling yourself. Whereas it seems uh, um, more rich for, our, for this group and for its objectives, political and coalitions that it might create 
to uh, allow and permit that proliferation of uh, self-naming and the vernaculars that uh, come with that, that bring different experiences and different ways of being in the world. Yeah, I mean, that actually makes me think of a, of a funny <clears throat> anecdote. I've had this issue with editors twice in the last few years where I said that someone looked gay and, um, uh, or read as gay, right? And like, you know, it was relevant. Uh, it was one time uh, uh, in a story about Eurovision uh, and about how the person performing for Russia, which has banned propaganda of, of uh, non-traditional uh, marital relations and, and all that stuff, how that, uh, the cont uh, c uh, contestant read as gay, right? And had a gay aesthetic. And another time I said that somebody who had fled Chechnya for, uh, you know, uh, 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 in the anti-gay purges looked gay. And so both times the editors just cringed, right? And this, is, this goes to the question of who is speaking and who is doing the naming because I thought, well, you know, I can see. And I'm telling you what I see. And I'm telling you that it is okay to look through my queer eyes for the purposes of the story. And the editor was looking at this and thinking, you know, you're looking through the eyes of the New Yorker, uh, which, which doesn't have a wouldn't right. Wouldn't say such things. Right? right, wouldn't say such things, wouldn't <laughs> see such things. Right. Is, you know, is intentionally blind to such things, would right. censor itself if it saw such a thing. Um, how do we balance that? How do we balance the sort of, you know, the, 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 the person who is speaking through this large gatekeeping um, entity? That is a good question, uh, and it's on fire right now, right? right. Uh, and not only in, in uh, the media or um, journalism, but also in academia. Um, well, I think part of it, or at least what I'm working on, is to think about other types of models of production of knowledge that is uh, less centralized, uh, that uh, has uh, different criteria, different frameworks to think about uh, writing and to think about readers. Um, so uh, to me, it's, it's taking a step at, at looking at the ways that we're currently organized and the power relations that sustain that and the interest that it serves. Uh, and I think in that world, uh, where we, we might come up with a, a different uh, uh, way of going about things, uh, those kinds of stories, the way you were telling them, could be read as situated rather than uh, the New Yorker's voice, which would presume to be universal, you know, in that sense, right? So we don't see such things because uh, the universal subject, the New Yorker, uh, I don't know, uh, the, the, uh, the New Yorker writer wouldn't write or see those things because uh, assumptions about readership, and, uh, and also I, I, I think it also has to do with the business model of these institutions as well. So changing the business model, uh, changing your assumptions about who's reading, and I think uh, uh, situating and, 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 and parting from that point uh, might alleviate some of those tensions that are currently there, that are, are there because they're based on very different assumptions and business models. Okay, so we get rid of the profit-driven media model. Uh, we get rid of the gatekeepers. Well, I mean, I, I think uh, it's not, yeah, you get rid of the gatekeepers, which doesn't mm -hmm. mean that it's chaos. You know, like mm -hmm. some people say, oh, then, then there's going to be chaos. I don't think necessarily. I mean, you could have uh, various perspectives. You could have rotating uh, leadership, uh, organizers. Uh, so maybe it's more to, uh, a critique of the uh, institution that wants to perpetuate itself and, and finds that one of the most efficient ways to do that is reproducing itself, which then requires that the power um, relations that are sustaining it also get reproduced. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, one way to think about it. Um, so I'm incredibly sympathetic to that argument. And, and I also have like this unusual path into mainstream media where I, you know, I started an activist and community media and I didn't actually come to like, working in a big established magazine until quite late in life. So, um, so at the same time, I'm sympathetic to the plight of these behemoths because, um, and, and, and what made me sympathetic was actually the Trump era, right? I was, I was specifically looking at the New York Times and thinking, okay, all the New York Times has going for it is being the New York Times, right? Uh, it's, it's the culture, 
it's this institutional memory. Like if the New York Times suddenly acquired the ability to steer this enormous ship efficiently and, 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 and adroitly, what would happen? It would stop being the New York Times. Okay. Um, how do you balance that? Right? Do, 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 yeah, I'm getting it. I mean, do, do, do I, I totally understand. Mm -hmm. Well, one part of it is that obviously uh, there's historical junctures that bring up uh, certain ways that, that power is contested, not only exercise, right? So for instance, in the Trump years, uh, those uh, organizations, uh, not only the New York Times, but, you know, uh, there's a lot of stories about journalists who were expelled or marginalized, could not get access, uh, and were denigrated. And we know of other parts of the world where journalists are killed and so forth. So, so obviously, there's junctures where having these institutions, uh, and that also applies to uh, institutions of higher learning and other types of institutions, is uh, fundamental for all kinds of reasons. So, and one of them is that if, if there weren't any institutions, you know, every generation would have to create their own and your whole life would go into that. So you wouldn't get to actually do a lot more than build it. Right. So there are many reasons why institutions exist, right? Uh, so I'm not necessarily uh, saying uh, death to all institutions. Uh, but uh, in a much more uh, dynamic environment, I think we, you could have the coexistence of, of institutions. And, and the issue is the freedom to be and not to be. So it's not to impose to, uh, uh, everybody has to be something, right? So you have institutions that have lengthy histories that change very slowly, uh, but uh, in certain contexts can uh, you know, play an uh, important role. And that people that work there uh, and pressures uh, outside of it um, you know, fuel some change. Uh, but there has to be also flexibility for new things to emerge and contest and shake it up. And, and part of the uh, challenge of the of, uh, of present, even though, you know, as we said earlier, there are, there's other platforms and other possibilities that are developing, is that too few institutions still have too much power uh, to produce all the news that fit to print, right? Uh, and carry too much weight. And sometimes that is very costly. And I think that the Trump election is one of them. Right. Uh, where the institutions are monopolizing the authority to say what's going on, and they have no clue. And that turned out to be quite costly, so, yeah. So, bringing it back to language, that idea of, <clears throat> of sort of dy dynamic development and the idea of understanding that, uh, that authority is, 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 should always be contested. Right? Um, how, do, how do we understand media language through that framework? Well, it, one of the symptoms, it seems to me, is mm -hmm. that when it flares up around language, uh, uh, a word used or not used, um, is, is telling us something about uh, the relations of power organizing that institution and, and some of the work that needs to be done, right? Um, so I think, uh, so it has a, a diagnostic, uh, you know, uh, dimension to it. Um, but I know, I mean, what, what, where are you thinking about this? Well, so I'm thinking that, um, that there are basic assumptions that, um, uh, that we have come close to questioning but haven't quite uh, gotten to, to, to challenging, which is, um, and the most basic assumption is that I think um, that language can be static, that it can be established once and for all, or at least once for a while, or at least once for everybody, right? It's sort of both, both vertically and horizontally. Um, that, um, <clears throat> and also that understandings are, um, can be constant. You know, one example, again, is the way, the way that <clears throat> identities change over time, right? I was gonna um, go there. <laughs> um, because I think that like, um, you know, once the memo went out last summer that we're going to capitalize black, a lot of reporters breathed out and thought, oh, okay, well, now I know how to cover this, mm -hmm. right? Um, but what if the word black becomes problematic? I mean, my, my prediction, it will. But it's always but, already problematic. Right. Any word that you pick is always already problematic for somebody. It's just you haven't heard from them yet, maybe. <laughs> you know? uh, so that's so how, how do you understand when it's like become so problematic that you have to do something uh, inst institutionally about the word? 
Well, I think part of it is what we were saying earlier, that we need more uh, opportunities to hear what's happening. Right. And from people that are naming themselves and, and attaching those names and those words to larger. So it's not only call me this and that's the end of it. There's reasons for it, right. you know? So I think part of it is uh, to be, you know, not sensitive is not the right word, but just be listening. Isn't that the job, right? To listen that, that people are constantly uh, shifting the ways that they see themselves and see the world as a result of our constant clashing and collaborating or just being human in the world, right? And growing. Exactly, and growing. So, so in that sense, uh, definitely one of the uh, least uh, desirable uh, pathways would be to, this is the, the words, this is in the guide, this is what I do, and I'm good, and I'm above suspicion, and nobody's going to question me, and I'm doing the, the right thing. But rather, really be listening to how things change and why, because that's the other part. Because the application of words without asking the rest of the questions becomes a pretty hollow exercise. You're not really l learning anything or, or producing new knowledge about it, right? Although, just two, two, two amendments to that. One is, that, yes, it, is, it can be hollow, but it's also valuable, right? Sure. Because, because, because so often, uh, the easiest way to dismiss any of it is to say, oh, that's just a hollow exercise. So we're not going to do anything, right? We're not going to pass this resolution. We're not going to change the, make this change to, to our style manual um, because it's, it's, it's meaningless. Yeah, by itself, it's meaningless. It's also essential sure. to be able to, t to take any other steps. And I think the other thing is that um, even as we talk about, and I think this is, you know, this, this is implicit in, in, in the way we're talking, <clears throat> but I want to spell it out. Um, even as we're talking about things constantly changing and, and being in flux, we also know that some things are right and some things are wrong, right? Uh, and, um, and I think that's a really difficult thing for people to grasp sometimes. It's like, okay, if, you, if I'm not going to uh, possibly use this word forever or capitalize it forever, does it mean I can refuse to capitalize it right now? Uh, and actually, no, right? Uh, because, because some things are right and some things are wrong. Well, you know, one thing that uh, you're reminding me about hollow is that, uh, for instance, um, in the wake of Black Lives Matter in academia, a lot of students focused on questions of renaming. Right. So let's say uh, uh, halls that were named after known slave owners and, and so forth. But um, in, in many conversations with students that I've had, uh, there's actually a, a lot of diversity of opinion about what does that mean. So some, studi some students would say, uh, yes, must change because at least that's uh, a, a way to um, rewrite this narrative, right, in a, in a different direction. Another student say, I really don't care what you call it uh, if it's not accompanied by some structural changes um, that really uh, allow for other things to happen here. And I think both positions are, are not inherently wrong, right? So it becomes contextual. So for some people saying, uh, we, don't, we actually don't care because while it's, it has the name of the slave owner, we know what time it is, you know? Because the other things are not changing. Um, which kind of reminds me also of, um, uh, during the Trump era, you know, there was a lot of people uh, saying that how he expressed himself was terrible. Uh, but, uh, but in a way, there was something about Trump's expressions on the area that I work on, uh, one of the main areas I work on in Puerto Rico, that was kind of refreshing, which is he was saying what, what they meant. what's really on the table, whereas Obama would have never said anything like that. But Obama was the one that appointed the, the board, the control board. Uh, to have uh, who, who also whose members, most of them have intrinsic ties to the banking industry and so forth. So that is highly contextual, how we evaluate whether uh, naming is very important or not. And also that any group of people will have a diversity of perspective regarding what that means and what are the better strategies to pursue whatever the, the goal is, right? Right, and that, and that gets us back to, the, to this problem that there are no universal recipes, and there are no recipes that will last forever. And so the only way that journalists can actually uh, try to grasp this is by starting by understanding that they're political actors, that we're political actors, right? That, that any act of writing and publishing 
is inherently a political act. In fact, I would say, you know, any act of even um, acquiring knowledge is a political act, and then it becomes multiplied by when you start disseminating that, that, that knowledge, which is such an obvious and also an absolutely revolutionary idea for American journalism. And, uh, and I, in my own practice as a filmmaker, uh, I realized that no matter how hard I tried to tell a story that was just and equitable, you know, there was always someone who would find it otherwise. That there was a violence that was uh, inherent, perhaps, in this process of naming, and that what I needed to do, I couldn't do it perfectly equitable and just, but I could open myself to telling how I saw it and entering into that debate right. and, uh, and, and doing with uh, you know, all you got, you know, uh, and, and learning uh, and exchanging and, and being willing to do that. Thank you. Thank you. What do you think about mainstream media organizations asking staff to moderate, in quotes, on social media and avoid expressing personal opinions about pressing social issues. Um, and you know, I think I think we understand it's inherently problematic because the um, <clears throat> the uh, there there is a profit motive in journalists being present on social media. So that's a reason we don't, and you know, I, I feel like I'm saying the obvious, but I think we, we kind of have to walk through these logical steps, right? We don't see uh, media organizations asking journalists to completely seize their uh, being present on social media. They want us, us, them to be present on social media, but within certain bounds, right? And we have to be cognizant that this is an entirely new negotiation of a kind of um, public, private divide for journalists. And actually, maybe it's an opening to a constructive conversation about the last point, point that I made, which is that journalists are political actors, right? Uh, and, and this reminder that the moment you stop writing an article and start existing in your um, <clears throat> you know, non-column inches way, uh, you have political opinions is perhaps a good reminder that you're a political actor at all times, right? And so, um, so maybe it will be more constructive to talk about it not in terms of moderating your social media presence, but in terms of integrating your social media presence uh, in, into your practice as a journalist. Francis, you're muted. Yes, I'm waiting for my questions, but I haven't arrived yet. So maybe you have a. Do you want Do you want to weigh in on the um, on the social media? Here question? it is. Here it is. So the question is about um, change in language in Puerto Rico and, uh, about Puerto Rico in U.S. media um, and how that has enabled some people who favor statehood uh, to promote. Um, integration as a state as a cure to address uh, unequal historical relation? Well, um, I would say that what the uh, increased uh, attention to Puerto Rico has done is made a larger portions of the population aware of some basic facts um, that, uh, that people were, were before uh, didn't know. Like there's been surveys about kind of before and after Maria, how many people knew that uh, Puerto Ricans were U.S. citizens? Uh, as we know, unequal U.S. citizens when it was legally so. Um, I don't think that has necessarily correlated with a greater um, support for statehood uh, decision makers. Um, in fact, I would argue that the, um, the, the current model of extraction, colonial extraction in Puerto Rico is founded on the current status, which is that uh, attraction of millionaires uh, to Puerto Rico who don't pay taxes, um, uh, capital gains taxes and other taxes. So I would see it very difficult that there will be a, a coalition of, of power that would uh, see it as uh, beneficial to the United States to incorporate 
Puerto Rico as a U.S. state um, in order to address that uh, issue. So in that sense, I would say that the, the mass media landscape has definitely shifted, but I don't think it's shifted enough uh, to create conditions for uh, a coalition to be able to um, convince uh, decision makers and a broad public that Puerto Rico should become a state. Now, the second inherent part of your question is that becoming a state uh, doesn't address colonialism. And I, I guess that depends fundamentally on how we define colonialism. So for people who define it as a subjection of a, a territory to a state, um, you know, for them, then a legal address, it's a legal issue, so it can be legally addressed. For those of us that view colonialism uh, and coloniality as a much more ample um, set of uh, inequities uh, and subjections, then uh, incorporating Puerto Rico as a state of the United States uh, does not in any way uh, necessarily address all these other inequities and, and power uh, hierarchies. Thank you. Um, third question is from Kavira Rajakupalan. Um, to both of your points, that we have an opportunity to allow for multiplicity of perspectives, ways of producing knowledge, and the fact that both media giants, that's in quotes, and community-based outlets have specific roles to play, how can universal voice institutions responsibly bring intimate in-community perspectives to their readers without cannibalizing or appropriating? That's, I mean, it's a, such a great question. Um, <clears throat> but I also think that it has this, you know, th there's this implicit assumption that there is a universal recipe for, for doing that, right? Like, like you can follow certain guidelines but, um, you know, and, 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 and it's also inherent in, in, in the way we talk about it, as though there could be prescriptions for sensitivity, prescriptions for, for feeling, right? Prescriptions for, um, for constantly evolving awareness. Um, but there can be, right? There has to be constantly evolving aware, awareness. Uh, but I think some basic rules have to involve, um, again, positioning the journalist. Uh, and this is something we talked about um, you know, uh, <clears throat> using perhaps some of the tools of ethnography to to understand where the media outlet is in relationship to the story, where the particular journalist is in the relationship to the story, and I think we do see more openings in in the universal voice media um, for that sort of uh, of story. I just think that you know it maybe makes sense for. Um, for journalists as a, as a group to talk about this and to make this to make these openings wider, but also be more intentional about telling those kinds of stories with a clear position and a clear perspective. Yes. Um, well, I, I agree with much about the, the first step is to perhaps question a little bit the notion of universal voice uh, and then, you know, provide different type of vocabulary to uh, better explain the dynamics between these various parts of the landscape. Um, and in tandem with that, uh, I think that uh, frameworks, however, are not sufficient. They, they also require uh, infrastructures of accountability and, and action and, and freedom of, of people to uh, move. So in that sense, uh, it seems that um, what could be happening, it's already happened to some extent, but I think we need more of it, uh, is collaborations where the various partners uh, bring very different strengths. Um, so, for instance, in, in the given scenario that we have that is crisscrossed by so many uh, in inequities that we walk into, uh, so you have institutions with a lot of capital, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of reach, and then you have uh, other institutions which have very deep knowledge of communities and, and, and maybe using different methods to do their reporting or their work. So what happens when these two collaborate? Well, some of what happens often is that the power inequities get reproduced in the collaboration. So part of the work is how to do this differently, uh, which doesn't mean that it's gonna be perfect, uh, but it might seed new, new possibilities, new ways of relating, new ways of uh, organizing both uh, partners. So, so I think what we need to wish for is that these collaborations transform the partners that are involved in it and can open up the possibilities. Okay. Okay, and I think our last question is, short of leaving organizations that are run by digital metrics, particularly those known for featuring quant uh, for favoring quantity over quality, what can we do to push back against problematic, ineffective terms 
when managers claim these terms are better SEO terms or do better online, particularly terms that aren't yet widely acknowledged to be problematic? I mean, I don't know. I mean, one of the vulnerabilities, of course, of the metrics, of course, I mean, just to say the obvious that I, I, I don't think that should be the bottom line of how uh, media organizations are organized. But uh, given that they are, I think a, the secret weapon is really all of us, all of us readers, not only the professionals. Uh, one of the conclusions that I that I drew from the work that I've done on, on mass media, um, movies, television, uh, is that uh, because these... Um, organizations are, are motivated by uh, the bottom line, it means that they have to sell us stuff. Uh, so I think one of the secret weapons is that we all mobilize, that we have infrastructure and mechanisms to push back. Uh, and, and we are vulnerable because, if, uh, they, I mean, they are vulnerable because if we don't buy their product, it falls apart. So apart from what professional organizations can do and what in, uh, journalists can do and, uh, uh, and so forth, I think there's also all of us as not only uh, professionals or and those that are or, or those that are not, but also as just people that uh, support these institutions, because without us, the consumer, they wouldn't exist, whether we're professional journalists or not. Um, and I think I would just add to that, that, um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a false dichotomy between organizations that are run by metrics and uh, and run by the by, by by the bottom line, and organizations that supposedly aren't. Really, you know, we exist, and this even includes uh, the non uh, the few nonprofits in the media world, right? We exist in this profit-driven media model, right? Um, and we we talk about the media as essential for democracy. We talk about the press as the fourth branch of government. But we don't ask any of the other branches of government to sell advertising or rent out space in order to be able to, to sustain themselves, right? We don't leave any of other other branches of government to um, <clears throat> uh, to fend for themselves and, and 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 to determine their future by the bottom line, right? Um, and and I so, so I I'm I'm really hesitant to say, oh, you know. Uh, 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 try try to get a job with 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 a, a media organization that's not going to make you stare at the number of clicks that you got every day. I mean that is a better existence to work with an editor who says, "Oh, you know, I don't care how many clicks you're getting," uh, but it's not. It, it's still not a sustainable model, right? The model that we we keep trying to 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 adjust and to and 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 to. Um, <clears throat> You know, to be socially responsible, to be politically responsive, uh, and yet, you know, we have this fundamental problem of trying to squeeze money out of our public life. So um, that's not, you know, that's not a terribly hopeful answer to to, to this question. But I think it's useful uh, to kind of keep in mind that it's not um, it's not any individual media outlet that's so terribly problematic. It's the whole model that's, uh, that's fundamentally flawed. And, and unless we problematize it, um, we're not even going to be able to sort of to make the necessary adjustments within the existing model. Um, I think I, I've just the, been told that no. we got five more minutes. Uh, is that still right? I don't know. Maybe this is I think we have like a couple of more minutes. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Um, six more minutes. Um, so, but I think we, uh, we've we've tackled the questions. Please feel free to. I have send two us more. here. I see. Uh, one is about uh, how to achieve an inclusive language with an ethnic perspective. If, for oh. example, Spanish is much of Latin America is under a context of colonization. Language is also geopolitical control. I'm, I'm assuming that you mean uh, other languages uh, in Latin America um, or in the, you know, so-called, uh, I mean, even when we talk about Hispano-Parlante media, no, uh, media in Spanish, uh, we're definitely overlooking the fact of enormous linguistic diversity in Latin America. Um, and that's also present in the, in the diaspora in the United States as, as more and more indigenous groups uh, migrate and have a presence over many, many years. Um, 
you know, it's interesting that this question uh, has been uh, attempted in different ways. Uh, so there's been uh, um, experiments at uh, providing translated uh, content in, in different languages. Uh, there's also been the attempt to do kind of Spanglish, uh, at least in, if you think about the first experiment, fusion of the, uh, having um, content in various languages at the same time. Um, I, I think that it's very important to both support uh, uh, media that's in multiple languages um, and that also that there is opportunities to uh, read um, the other languages, right? So I think part of the way forward there would be the best in that. Now, of course, uh, um, it's, it's very difficult for uh, corporations to do this because uh, they, they feel that it uh, depletes their resources. However, I, I would concur with the gist of your question that uh, the language that is used uh, is both a site of control and contestation and that uh, a, a useful premise, uh, and this is true of the United States at large, normally among the Latin American population, is a multilingual uh, country. Uh, therefore, uh, we need to have support for lang uh, media in multiple languages. Um, Mark, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that. There's another one that I see here. I don't know if you have another one on your end. Uh, no, go ahead. What's, what's, the, what's our next question? So the next one, uh, apologies if this was already addressed, but how does the debate over Latinx apply here? Well, uh, I recall mentioning that at some point uh, as a... As a as a way to talk about this question of, uh, or this gist or desire that some people seem to have for uh, homogenization as a condition for Latino politics. So my point was basically that um, if there's a group of people that want to be uh, called and, and, and see new possibilities in, in affirming uh, identification as Latinx, I don't think that should be seen as threatening to other people who want to be seen and recognize themselves as Latinos or Hispanics. Um, you know, so and, 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 and to a large extent, because my premise is that uh, Latino politics is inherently a coalitional politics to begin with. So it's not that we're fragmented and we need to come together, but rather that uh, we are a very diverse group of people and we have at, at various moments uh, historically and presently been able to coalesce uh, many of us around, not everybody, but many of us around certain issues uh, of common concern. But the, the fundamentals of that has to be worked on. It's not an inherent issue. And I, and I don't think, uh, um, you know, imposing unity where there's none uh, necessarily it adds to our, our power. Uh, I think our power would actually derive from uh, understanding where everybody's coming from uh, more than trying to impose a, a unity that's not present. Although I don't know that's what you meant. <laughs> you may have meant something <laughs> else that you meant. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't, um, I don't have expertise on uh, on the Latinx question. Uh, I I will just throw a uh, you know a, a thought into this, which is. Um, we constantly have to balance on this edge between uh, prescriptiveness in, in the use of language by the media um, and, and context, right? Uh, and, and again, you know, I've referred a, a couple of times to the use of language around LGBTQ issues, right? Um, I mean, I've had, I've had silly uh, arguments with editors where they automatically insert the Q uh, to LGBT where it is not appropriate, right? Where it's like in the context of legal rights, uh, whatever the Q stands for um, isn't actually um, uh, is, isn't actually relevant, right? Uh, and so, uh, so that's, you know, that's an obvious example, but it's just an example of how the writer and the editor and the entire system have to be cognizant of language actually being, being contextual. Right? Um, and I think now we're actually out of time Yes, I, I get time over over here. Uh, <laughs> right. so, uh, it's been such a pleasure talking with you. Absolutely. And and uh, the only thing I wanted to add is that after our conversation, I started thinking, oh, my God, I didn't uh, contextualize this word and that word. But it goes back to what uh, you were saying in the conversation that um, that it's not a matter of the perfect word. It's really in this uh, process to investigate and learn and, and change uh, and, and open possibilities. So, uh, so I guess it's an invitation for all of us to continue doing that. I think that's an excellent conclusion. Thank you. Thank you.